Good morning, everyone. That's better. I can hear you now. I've realized through this whole period of COVID that my ears are really important, that <laughs> Sunday mornings are hanging on my ears. So masks, glasses, microphones, everything. So uh, um, please pray for my ears. <laughs> I really need them. Um, last week we looked at and, uh, this command from Jesus to love our enemies. And, uh, and I had too much material, so you're getting the end of that preach today. Okay, so I might recap slightly. So if you weren't here last week and you haven't watched the YouTube video, then you'll need to go back and watch that because there's lots of good stuff in there. Okay, but we, we, we've, over, over the summer I've been looking at this, this whole um, theme of authentic relationships and then we had Dennis spoke as well about uh, his relationship with God and his and his father and it's a, for me this is a critical point of Christianity it's about relationship when Jesus was asked the question what do I need to do to inherit eternal life Jesus answer was to love the Lord your God with all your heart with all your soul and all your mind and all your strength and to love your neighbor as yourself. That was his answer. These, he says, these commands sum up all the commands and prophets. So it's about relationship. And then Jesus made this really difficult command that we should love our enemies. And we looked at that last week. And we began to look at an example of that. We looked at David and Saul and how David shows mercy to Saul. Even though Saul was out to kill David, David shows mercy. He had the opportunity to kill Saul and he doesn't kill him because he realizes this is God's anointed one. He doesn't, David said, doesn't want to become like Saul because that's what happens when we embrace the, the, the dark side. When we, when we allow our anger and our bitterness and our rage to shape our character rather than allowing love and loving, our, loving God because that's, that, that's the source of our love, loving God and loving our neighbors and loving our enemies to actually shape our character. So we want to stay in this. So what we looked at last week was this loving our enemy. And, but there's a cost. There's a cost in that love. And there's, so what I want to talk about this morning is the cost of forgiveness. Because someone has to pay the price. I often hear... Um, Christians, people complaining that we shouldn't help people because they deserve what's happening to them. So they might say, oh, they've got satellite TV and they smoke. Why, why should we give them food? Why should we help them out? Why should we show mercy in their situation? And I want to I wanna really ex not explore that detail, but actually, why? Why is mercy that we sung about so important? Because you know what? It's not important for that person, although it is. It's more important for you. It's more important that we show mercy than, re than receive mercy. Don't know what that was. It could be many. But because the full impact of forgiveness, the full impact of us showing forgiveness, us showing mercy, isn't always received at the time. And it isn't actually always received in this world. A lot of what you do that's full of mercy, you will receive the benefit of in the next life. 
So, let's read the passage. We're going to look at Matthew 18. This is a familiar passage, I'm sure, to most of you. We're starting at verse 15 and read both sections down to verse 35. And this is Jesus teaching about forgiveness. I'm reading from the English Standard Version. And here, are verse 15, Matthew 18. If your brother sins against you, go and tell him his fault between you and him alone. If he listens to you, you have gained your brother. But if he does not listen, take one or two others along with you that every charge may be established by the evidence of two or three witnesses. If he refuses to listen to them, tell it to the church. And if he refuses to listen even to the church, let him be to you as a Gentile and a tax collector. Truly I say to you, whatever you bind on earth shall be bound in heaven. Whatever you loose on earth shall be loosed in heaven. Again I say to you, if two of you agree on earth about anything they ask, it will be done for them by my Father in heaven. For where two or three are gathered in my name, there am I among them. Then Peter, Peter, I love Peter, came up and said to him, Lord, how often, how often will my brother sin against me and I will forgive him? So Peter's asking, how many times do I, I forgive him? And then he says, shall I forgive him as many as seven times? And uh, I, can, I can imagine Peter being quite proud about this answer, saying, well, you know, I'll forgive my brother seven times. And Jesus says, I do not say to you seven times, but 77 times. And then he tells this parable. Therefore, the kingdom of heaven may be compared to a king who wished to settle accounts with his servants. When he began to settle, one was brought to him, owed him 10,000 talents. And since he could not pay, his master ordered him to be sold with his wife and his children and all that he had and payment to be made. So the servant fell on his knees imploring him, have patience with me and I will pay you everything. And out of pity for him, the master of the servant released him and forgave him the debt. But when the same servant went out, he found one of his fellow servants who owed him a hundred denarii. It's a very small amount compared to what he's been forgiven. And seizing him, he began to choke him and say, pay what you owe. So his fellow servant fell down and pleaded with him, have patience with me and I will pay you. He refused and went out and put him in prison until he should pay the debt. When his fellow servants saw what had taken place, they were greatly distressed. And when they went and reported to their master all that had taken place, then his master summoned him and said to him, You wicked servant, I forgave you all that debt because you pleaded with me and should not have had mercy on your fellow servant as I had mercy on you. And in his anger, his master delivered him to the jailers until he should pay all his debt. So also my heavenly father will do to every one of you if you do not forgive your brother from your heart. Let us pray. Lord Jesus, we thank you that you have forgiven us from a debt that we could not pay. You have forgiven us completely of our sin. Lord, we thank you that you made it possible for us to be reconnected, reconciled with God because of the price that you paid for us. And we pray you help us this morning as we think about those around us, as we think about those who have sinned against us, as we think about those who need mercy that we would sense your mercy and your love for us first. And we pray in your precious name. Amen. Okay, so I want to talk just briefly about three things this morning. Firstly, quickly, what is forgiveness? Secondly, the forgiveness costs. And thirdly, why should I forgive? We have in this passage that we've just read, Jesus explaining and then showing forgiveness in two different ways. 
First, he talks about how we can deal with sin against brothers in a church situation. Brothers and sisters in a church, in a local church. So in a local church, if someone sins against you, the complaint procedure isn't that you come and knock on the pastor's door and say, so and so has done this. Can you deal with them? That's, that's not what the Bible tells us to do, and that's not our procedure. So please refrain. <laughs> but, but what Jesus is saying is that you need to go to your brother to win him over. And we'll talk a little bit more about that as we go along. The, the idea isn't that you, you go to tell them they're wrong, to put them in their place, but to win them over to win your brother, to restore the relationship that's been damaged. It gives us a step-by-step guide almost, but it's all about relationship. It's not a step-by-step process, it's about a relationship. And then Jesus tells this parable in the response to Peter's question about the king who wants to forgive his servants. That's such a a great way to start, isn't it? God wants to forgive. God wants to forgive. He isn't having his arm twisted. He wants to forgive. And he responds when people come before him. You know, we, we see this this servant who owes a great debt and he says a debt that he couldn't pay and yet he says he pleads with his master forgive me give me more time to pay don't put me into slavery and the master forgives his debt in home says you can go free and then this servant goes after someone that owes him a few pennies in, in comparison. Because he hasn't received mercy. He hasn't got it. It isn't in his heart. He hasn't let what the father, what the master's done for him, work out through him. The very sense of being a Christian, it means what you've received from God, you give to other people. That the more you get from God, the more it comes out of you. So those who've been forgiven much will be able to forgive much. And we need to think about that sometimes. We need to remember what God has forgiven us from, what we were like. Because it helps us in our relationship with one another. But there's a very chilling remark at the end of that parable. Which you want to pick up again at the end. But the, the chilling remark is if you don't forgive your brother from your heart. God won't forgive you. Now, for me, that's, that sentence is scary, isn't it? Because we, we believe that if we ask for forgiveness, we're forgiven. Isn't that right? That's what we preach. That if you ask for forgiveness, God will forgive you from any sin. True? Yes? We believe that because it says it in other places in the Bible. But then when it says that... What what does that mean? And what I believe it means is if you've really received forgiveness of God, you cannot help but forgive people. If you are a Christian and you've received the forgiveness of God, it is in your heart. Your heart has changed and therefore you will forgive people. If you're finding that you're, you're holding on forgiveness... What you need to do is sort out your relationship with God first. Because that will where the problem will be. Now we'll we'll deal with some of 
those things as we go along because there is pain and there's difficulty and there's a, there's a process for working these things out sometimes. So if we, what, what is, but what is forgiveness? Let's just, uh, just want to define what, what forgiveness is. And um, Tim Keller says there's three things that you need to do to uh, allow forgiveness in your life. If, if someone sinned against you, how do you forgive them? Well, the first one he says is you decide not to punish that person or someone by bringing up the sin that they've committed all the time. By constantly reminding them that they've sinned against you. It's a good way to show forgiveness. It's a first step. Not to keep talking about it. Secondly, he says, decide not to bring it up with other people. There's decisions that we have to make. Decide not to keep telling other people what they did to you. Those, you know, or oh, that person, you know what they did to me. Highlighting other people's sin. To allow someone else to make a judgment against them. Hoping, because we, you know why we do that? Because we hope that other person will punish them for the sin they committed against us. And then thirdly, don't dwell on what they have done. Hoping that God will intervene for you. Because if we dwell on our thoughts and we think about it, we're hoping that God will do something to this person, that he will, he will reap his vengeance or your vengeance on that person. So these are three ways that we can operate in forgiveness. First, that we, we don't talk to that person. Don't keep telling them what they've done wrong. I, you know, I, certainly I know that in, in my, my marriage, how we do these things, don't we? When you've done something wrong and your wife reminds you that you've done something wrong again. And we defend ourselves by what about you? You did that last week. We do, don't we? We remember, we fight back. We defend ourselves by pushing it back on that other person. So let's not bring up those sins all the time. Let's not repeat them. Let's not keep repeating them to other people. And let's not keep dwelling on them. That's the start. This is the start of forgiveness. What you talk and what you think about. Neil Anderson says, and he's the guy who wrote uh, the Freedom in Christ course and the books around that. He says, forgiveness deals with your pain, not another person's behavior. Forgiveness deals with your pain. That's, I find that so helpful. Forgiveness is not dealing with what they've done. It's dealing with the pain that you are experiencing. Is that what forgiveness is? Secondly, forgiveness costs. Forgiveness costs. There is a cost in forgiveness because someone has to pay. Let me give you an example. If, if I loan someone uh, something, yeah, let, let me say I, I loan uh, I loan Rick my, my power drill, or let me, let me say my jigsaw, my jigsaw, power jigsaw to, to renovate his new house, and he breaks it, and uh, I mean, it, it's second hand, you know, I've had it for a while, and uh, Rick breaks it, and he brings it back to me, and I say, that's okay, Rick, I forgive you. Now, what I have is a broken jigsaw, but a good relationship. But I have to pay for a new jigsaw. Now, whether that's the blade or the thing, I still have to pay. Someone has to pay for what is broken. Now, whether Rick pays, because he's very good like that, and he would like, give me a check for the new jigsaw. Uh, but if I say, no, it's okay, Rick. It was, it was old. I've used it a lot over the years, and I was going to buy a new one anyway. I, I'm, gonna have to, I'm paying for that sin. Not quite a sin. But it's the same thing, isn't it? There's a payment that needs to be made. And that's the same with our sins against one another. There's a payment. Some damage is being caused. Someone has to pay. And, but because for, forgiveness, let me tell you what forgiveness isn't. I've told you what forgiveness is. 
Forgiveness isn't just letting people get away with it, as we talked about last week. Forgiveness is not just sweeping it under the carpet and just allowing people to do whatever they want to you. Forgiveness, Jesus doesn't intend us to be walked all over by everybody else who wants to do whatever they want to us. That's not the point. That's not what loving your enemies do. And forgiveness means because God has a high value for justice. He desires justice. He needs justice. So forgiveness is not a passive thing. So when we talked about last week about when someone strikes you on the cheek, you turn your other cheek to them also. It, it, it's, it's, it's not a passive act. It's doing something different. It's not letting just hit, hit the same cheek over and over again and just allowing them to do that. It's doing something different. It's turning and saying, hey, no, you're not going to hit that cheek. Hit this one. And then what are they going to do? And I, the, what, what tends to happen is people have to, you, and, and again, it's not that you always have to do that. It's a term, isn't it? It's a principle. What are you going to do that's different? How are you going to respond to this person that's sinning against you and doing this thing? Are you going to sort of let them do it to you over and over again? Are you going to stand and say something and, and, and confront that behavior? There's three possible responses that we have when people sin against us. And you might, you might fit into one of these. Say nothing and boil on the inside. I can't believe Rick hasn't washed the cups again. <laughs> He's actually very good. I do allow him freedom from washing the cups on a Friday afternoon. But it is, we can boil, can't we? Because we can get so frustrated. I'm going to forgive them for mushing the cups. He's left them again. I haven't checked this with Rick, but we, we have a good relationship. So we can do that. We can, we can respond and think, well, that's not, that's not forgiveness, by the way. That's not forgiveness. Saying nothing and boiling on the inside about what someone done is not forgiveness. Okay? Secondly, we can verbalize our hate and complaints about Rick not washing the cups again at the front of the meeting so everybody knows. <laughs> that man, on Friday afternoon, he left the cups. He didn't wash them. I think he actually did this week, didn't he? So we can, we can verbalize it, so we can keep it to ourselves and we can boil about it on the other side. Or we can verbalize and tell everyone that Rick hasn't washed the cups or whatever that sin might be. And obviously that's trivial. Or, thirdly, we can love that person and we can seek to win them over. So what we read in Matthew 18. If your brother sins against, go and tell him his fault. Rick, Friday afternoon really help me to get my preach organized if you wash the cups we can work this together I'll do them this Friday if you do them next Friday okay we have to work, win our brother over if we look back at um, the story of David and, and Saul that we saw so let me give you a quick recap in 1, 1 Samuel verse 26. David goes, for, Saul is looking to kill David. He's already, a, he already had an opportunity, David, to re, re, return that favor to Saul uh, when Saul comes into a cave that David's hiding in. But in this second occasion in, in 1 Samuel 26, uh, Saul comes looking for, for David and they're camping. He's camping with 3,000 of his men on a hill. And David goes to this place, he, he sees where Saul is, and he goes into the camp. Him and Abishai go into the camp, and they go right up to where Saul is. No one wakes up, and he, they go right into his presence. And Abishai says to, says to David, God has given your enemy into your hands. I will kill him. I will hit him once. He won't hear a thing. 
And David says, no, he's the Lord's anointed. I will not put my hand against him. And he takes Saul's spear and he takes his jug and he goes to the other side of the mountain. And then he, he responds. He shouts out to the camp to try and restore. He doesn't, he doesn't, he, he's not, and we'll just, let's just read some verses because I think it's just, just helpful. If we read a, 1 Samuel 26 verse 17. So at 13 he goes across, it says, then David went to the other side and stood far off on the top of a hill with a great space between them. And, and David called to the army and to Abner. And in verse 17, Saul recognized David's voice and said, is this your voice, my son David? And David said, it is my voice, my lord, O king. And he said, why does my lord pursue me after his, uh, why does he pursue after his servant? For what have I done? What evil is on my hands? Now therefore let the lord, the king, hear the words of his servant. If the lord who has stirred you up against me may he accept an offering. So if it's, if it's God who stirred you against me, Saul, if God has said that this, this David has sinned against you, may accept an offering. But if it is men, may be cursed by God. For they have driven me out this day that I should not have no share in the heritage of the Lord. So David's saying, listen, I've, I've lost my position in Israel. I've lost, I can't mix with my family. I'm an exile. I'm living in the wilderness. But I'm just, he carries on to say, I'm just a, a single flea. A partridge in the mountains. And Saul says, I have sinned. Return, my son David. I will do you no more harm. Because my life was precious in your eyes this day, behold, I have acted foolishly and have made a great mistake. So here again, Paul, Saul is saying to David, I see that you see me as precious, that you could have killed me and you didn't. Whereas Saul is saying, if I had the opportunity, you would not be able to speak now. And he sees that and he, he apologizes. He repents of his sin. Now we don't hear any other accounts of Saul trying to kill David after this. But David wasn't just going to go back to camp and get all chummy with Saul again. But it's an act of forgiveness for David. He's reaching out to Saul's bitter heart. Hard heart. He, Saul is bitter because... God has rejected him and rejected his family from the throne. They're aware that the anointing of God is on David. But David doesn't want to replace Saul. He doesn't want to, you know, well, I'm the, I'm the guy now. Just move along, Saul. I'm coming in. No, he, he honors that man. Because what David realized, and you think as, um, you know, slightly off my notes now, but I, as I, I was just thinking about this. You reflect on this. It doesn't tell us in the passage. But why does David go all the way to the midst of Saul's camp? Doesn't make sense, does it? Why would you do that if this man is trying to kill you and he's surrounded by 3,000 soldiers? You take one soldier with you and you go into the camp. There's probably only one reason you would do that. It's not to see what bedtime drink Saul would, would had. It was to kill him. I, I'm, I'm assuming that's why David went into the camp. Because in his heart, he was angry. Because he's already let Saul go once. Now, now I, I'm reading between the lines. Okay, this is, isn't in the passage. But why would you go? But when he gets there, he realizes. Because God is doing something in his heart. God is doing something. He's working through his heart and he realizes that Saul represents God. That it's more about David's heart than it is about what Saul's doing. So God is working on David's heart all this time. He's revealing what's in David's heart. God said, I don't want you to be like Saul. I want you to be my man. Forgiveness 
doesn't always change the other person's behavior. That's not the purpose. We talked about that before. Sometimes it can. So here with David's reaching out to Saul because he wants to see a change of behavior. But actually, it, it, firstly, it's about his heart. But actually, he's wanting to see a change. But it's not the main reason. This encounter, I think, puts David in a really strong position in Israel. And, and if you read the life of David, he, he, is, he makes such amazing leadership decisions, even though he's not perfect. But he makes amazing leadership decisions that really speak into how we deal with one another in, in a godly way. Let me just read a quote from Neil Anderson about the cost of forgiveness. Because it cost David. It cost David to forgive Saul. It cost him his freedom to do what he wanted to do. He, yeah, he would say he was free. He was free to wander in the woods. He wasn't free to live in Israel. From on this point off, he goes into Philistine and, and tries to live there. But then he's rejected by the Philistines. Then the Amalekites attack his family and his friends. And, it, you know, it, it, it doesn't get better for David just after this. It gets more difficult. But God is working in his heart. This is what Neil Anderson says about the cost of forgiveness. Forgiveness is agreeing to live with the consequences of another person's sin. Forgiveness is costly. We pay the price of the evil we forgive. Yet you're going to live with these consequences whether you want to or not. Your only choice is whether you do so in the bondage of bitterness or the freedom of forgiveness. That's how Jesus forgave you. He took the consequences of your sin upon himself. All true forgiveness is substitutional because no one really forgives without bearing the penalty of the other person's sin. Penalty has to be paid. There's a cost for sin. So listen, let me give you a quick process because we're Time is against us. Quick process. If, you, if someone has sinned against you, acknowledge. Acknowledge the hurt in your life. Acknowledge your feelings, your hate. Acknowledge them before God. If you can, you need to feel that pain. You need to visit that pain, Neil Anderson says. Let it surface so God can deal with it. Because if you, actually, if you just keep burying it, if you keep pushing it down, doesn't get dealt with. God can only heal things that we allow him to heal. Speak it out. In a loving way. Forgive the person. Specifically, be specific. Mention people the name and what they've done. Put it before God. But and also he says, don't don't try and rationalize why they did it, or explain offenders' behavior, because that actually starts to put conditions on it. So we can go through this simple process, coming to faith. Because remember, forgiveness deals with your pain and not another's behavior. And Neil Anderson says that in his book, uh, he says that positive feelings will follow in time. You may not feel positive at the times and that there was there's examples that we could give uh, from the but we time is against us today but let me show you one example that I think is powerful and this is Jesus on the cross it's in Luke 23 verse 34 Jesus in the midst of being crucified says these words father forgive them for they know not what they do Father, forgive them for they know. So in the midst of their sin, in crucifying Christ, Jesus is offering forgiveness. He's praying for our, we can't just say, well, it was them. It was the Jews and the Romans. They're part of that. We're the world. They represent the world. Forgive them because they don't know what they're doing. Now, in some ways, it sounds like Jesus is trying to rationalize it. But Jesus is fully engaged. He, I think at that point, Jesus, again, is looking out for his heart. He's about to go and defeat 
the enemy, i.e. death and sin. And he needs to know that he's going into that with the right heart in mind. He's not doing it against his will. He's doing it willingly. He's going in and saying, Father, forgive them. My heart, he's protecting his own heart. He's coming before them. So why should we forgive? The main reason for us to forgive is because we have been forgiven. Not only is it dealing with our pain, but because we want to deal with our pain. But actually the main reason to forgive is because God has forgiven you. Because unforgiveness leads to other problems, more serious ones, bitterness, anger, hatred. Jesus' death on a cross means you're forgiven because he has paid the price. He has paid the cost of forgiveness for you by dying. He's paid the full cost for you and everyone. We forgive because Christ has forgiven us. Jesus is not asking you to do something he hasn't already done. And we owe a bigger debt like in the parable. We owe a vast debt. I can forgive because I have been forgiven. And I know what I've done. Let me just read Philippians 2. Because I feel this explains perhaps more fully. In verse 5 it says, Have this mind among yourselves which is yours in Christ Jesus who though he was in the form of God, did not count equality with God a thing to be grasped. So what Jesus counted was the cost of your sin. The the cost for him was not being equal with God at that point. Being separated from God at that point. He took all our sin on himself. He emptied himself, it says, taking the form of a servant, being born in the likeness of men and being found in human form. He humbled himself, becoming obedient to the point of death, even death on a cross. Jesus counted the cost. He paid the price for you and your brother or sister. The end of the Lord's Prayer and, and in, you know, if we think about the Lord's Prayer, that part of that prayer is, is a prayer of forgiveness, isn't it? Forgive those who have trespassed against us. As we've been forgiven. And then at the end of that, all Jesus also says, you don't forgive your brother from your heart. I won't forgive you. We need to embrace God's forgiveness and allow that to work through our lives so we can forgive other people of their sins we need to trust the anointed one we need to trust Christ that what he has done he can work through us keeping close to him is what makes us more forgiving realizing how pure he is and what he has done as Denise was saying earlier actually we're never going to pay the price but he has paid it in full and we just have to keep trusting him however difficult however hard however painful keep trusting him time is up I just want to finish with one last verse because I'd be amiss of me not to give an opportunity for us to confess our sins Because we can think everyone else is a sinner and we're not. We're the the perfect ones. We're the ones that are doing it all right. And I know, because I know me, that that is not the case. This is what 1 John 1, 5 said. This is the message that we heard from him and proclaimed to you. That God is light and in him is no darkness at all. If we say we have fellowship with him 
While we walk in darkness, we lie and do not practice the truth. But if we walk in the light as he is in the light, we have fellowship with one another. And the blood of Jesus, his son, cleanses us from all sin. If we say we have no sin, we deceive ourselves and the truth is not in us. If we confess our sins, he is faithful and just to forgive us our sins and to cleanse us from all unrighteousness. If we say we have not sinned, we make him a liar and his word is not in us. Let's stand and let's pray. So perhaps you're here this morning, you're feeling unforgiveness towards someone or perhaps you're feeling like you need forgiveness. You go both ways. You can confess your sins to God this morning because it's both these things are about our relationship with God. And if we can get our relationship with God in the right place, actually the other relationships will follow. Receiving God's forgiveness when we confess our sins and being able to forgive those who have sinned against us means that that we continue to forgive. We continue to be forgiven. So let's pray. If there's something on your mind, whether it's unforgiveness or you feel like you need forgiveness, just bring that to God in a moment now. You don't need to speak it out, but just let it. What is, what, what is, what is, what is God saying to you at this moment? Because we need to respond to those things. God has revealed something in you this morning. A measure of unforgiveness for someone. Allow him to work in your life, Lord Jesus. Come by your Holy Spirit, we pray. Lord, we bring ourselves to you this morning. Lord, we we desire to be living in your forgiveness, living in your ways, Lord God. We confess our sins to you this morning. We bring ourselves to you this morning and say, Lord, we want to walk in the light. We want to walk in close relationship with you. Would you help us? Lord, as we feel your forgiveness, as we feel your delight, Lord, we bring it with our very hearts deep inside us, Lord. We want to be free of unforgiveness. We want to be free of the guilt for the sins that we've committed. Free to live, free to follow you, free to be in relationship. Lord, help us, we pray. Lord, and those of us that felt that the people have sinned against us. Lord, we pray for them now. We bring those sins before you. We pray, would you help us forgive? Would you help us to release our own hearts from that pain? Come and work in our lives, oh God. We want more of you. We want to be more like you, oh God. We want to be able to say that in the midst of that pain. Father, forgive them. Father, forgive them. So we pray, would you come now? Would you come now, Holy Spirit? Come and speak. This might not be easy for some, but Jesus is asking you to take that step. And he says he'll be with you. He's been through it. He knows what it is like. He knows what it is like to be rejected. He knows what it's like to be betrayed. He knows what it is like to be beaten. People to call him names, to be whipped. 
and to be killed. Killed for something he didn't do. The perfect one. Sacrificed himself to pay for our sin. Thank you, Lord. Amen. If you, um, if you've never given your life to Christ, never asked for forgiveness from Christ for all your sin, then today could be the day that you can do that. If He's speaking to you about that now, and just give it an opportunity. I'm not going to call you out now, but just come and see either Rick or I at the front. If you feel that like you want to take that step and say, look, I, I feel this weight of guilt of things I've done, I want to get right with God, then do that today. We don't have to come to God with everything right. Jesus calls you to himself the way you are, and he changes you by being in your life and you being in his Amen.